Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about, also about matching, so Vinatan saved me some of the introduction. Uh, I will talk about a form of manipulation of stable matchings uh, using minimal blacklist. I'll explain what that is soon. This is uh, forthcoming in EC 2014. Um, okay, so um, let's quickly recap the stable matching problem. This is an age test, by the way, for all students here. I really hope there's no teacher who doesn't know it. Never mind. Okay. Um, okay, so. Uh, in 1962, Gale and Shapley presented a problem and solved it. Actually, Gale presented it, Shapley solved it. Uh, and they said this. Say that we have two finite sets. I know you, don't interrupt. Yeah. Uh, say that you have two f finite sets. You have to explain that to us now. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Uh, this, uh, this was a matchmaking show with Dudu Topaz in the 80s. And never mind. Never mind. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay, <laughs> clock is ticking, so later. Okay, say that we have two disjoint finite sets, uh, W and M, let's call the W women and M men. Um, this is all notation by Gale and Shapley, don't blame me. Okay, um, so we're looking for a one-to-one -one matching, meaning that we want to uh, make pairs of men and women such that no man is paired with more than one woman. No woman is paired with more than one man. Um, and assume for now, uh, whoever knows uh, matching and so on, we're talking about one-to-one -one only in this talk. Assume for now that there's an equal number of men and women. And uh, we're going to make this matching according to some preferences that were given for men and women. Assume that each man has a strict order of all women. Uh, the woman at the top is the one he prefers most. The woman at the bottom is the one he prefers least. He's actually allowed to give us also uh, an order of only part of the women. Any woman not appearing there is unacceptable to him, meaning that he would rather be alone than matched with her. Same goes for women. They have a preference list of, of men ranked from top to bottom, and whoever doesn't appear there is blacklisted. Uh, the goal is to find a stable matching. Stable means three things. M rational. No man is matched with a woman from his blacklist. Remember that we said that he would rather be alone. So if we match him from someone from his blacklist, he'd rather divorce and run away or something. W rational. Same thing, only reversed. Model is completely symmetric. And a uh, third thing that's um, called pairwise stability, that's the main issue, is that if W and M are not matched, then at least one of them prefers his or her current condition over being matched with the other. Otherwise, they could both leave their spouses or lack of spouses and go to Vegas and get married, elope, or whatever. Another way to think about it is that if um, another way to think about it is that if uh, M prefers W over her match. If M prefers W over his match, then W prefers her match over M. Okay, so. And in 2002, Al Roth, uh, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics two years ago for uh, matching, um, did a big survey of many mechanisms used throughout the years in sports and in the high schools and in whatnot, and basically came to the conclusion that successful matching mechanisms produce stable outcomes meaning that whichever mechanisms throughout history that existed that didn't produce stable outcomes uh, were abandoned at some point or another. Um, so, uh, Gale and Chaplin, as I said, 19, 1962, gave uh, proof that a stable matching always exists for every profile of preference lists. That is not a trivial, um, non-trivial, that the fact that it always exists regardless of how you set the preferences of every player. And they also gave an efficient algorithm for finding the M-optimal stable matching. The M-optimal stable matching is the matching, also it's not trivial that one exists, but it does, with the following property. Every man prefers it, weakly prefers it, over every other stable matching. Okay, it means that there is no other stable matching in which any man gets a better match than in this one, and this is simultaneously for all men. 
That's the surprising part. And in 1971, McVitie and Wilson showed that the M optimal stable matching is also the W worst stable matching, meaning that no woman, uh, whichever woman you take, there is no other stable matching that is worse than this stable matching. So it's really, sorry? No, I'm, I'm saying that there is an M optimal stable matching and I'm saying that the M optimal stable matching is the W worst stable matching. I said nothing about courting. Okay. And so really this shows that th there is some, the, the M optimal stable matching is really um, at the edge of some scale here. Dumans and Friedman in 81 have further shown that no man can gain from manipulating the M optimal stable matching. Manipulating meaning that there is, one could have thought that maybe if some man would have submitted a different falsified preference list, maybe he would have, and then you would see what the M optimal matching is with all of the true preference lists and with this falsified preference list, then maybe this man would have been assigned a better, ma ma a better match than what he would have been assigned if he would, would have told the truth. So there is no possibility to manipulate the algorithm this way. However, in 85, Geld and Sotomayor have shown that generally some woman is better off doing this. Okay, generally meaning, meaning unless the M optimal stable matching is by chance the unique stable matching and the W optimal stable matching. So in general, some woman would be better off lying. So once again, there's uh, the, the M optimal stable matching is really at the end of, 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 a, of a scale here. So let's talk about full side manipulation, which is the topic of this talk. Uh, assume for a moment that all men collude together. Let's say that we're using the M optimal stable matching. That's what people use. That's what usually used in most mechanisms. Um, let's say that all men collude together in a room and decide that they want to force some matching mu. This may not be the M optimal stable matching, but they decide that they want to set their preferences so that once you look at the question of what the M optimal stable matching is, given the preferences of the men and the real preferences of the women, it would be mu. So, easy observation. Coalition of all men can force any W rational full matching, okay, if this matching requires any woman to be matched with someone with, from her blacklist. There's nothing the men can do about it. But any W rational full matching can be forced as the M optimal stable matching if all men collude together and modify their preferences accordingly. How do they do that? Very simple. Each man lists as the top choice his match from M, from U. List everyone after that order insignificant. And you can see that each man being matched with his top choice is a matching, it's mu, and it's stable since no man would rather deviate, so that's the M optimal stable matching. Gell and Sotomayor in 85 have shown that the coalition of all women can force the W optimal stable matching as the M optimal one. Since we're doing the M optimal one, women have to work harder in order to force something as the M optimal stable matching. By truncating preference lists. What does truncating preference lists mean? It means that if a woman has a preference list with five places, then she says, okay, I'm removing this. This is my new preference list. Truncating means that uh, we're only leaving uh, the head from uh, until some point of the preference list and move everyone below that point to the blacklist. Now, that's true. Women can indeed force the W optimal stable matching as the M optimal one by, tr by truncating preference lists, but there are a few issues here. This requires blacklists. Okay, the, the manipulation by the men does not require blacklists. This requires potentially long blacklists. And actually, it requires blacklists possibly each of size uh, number of men minus one. So actually, in some cases, each woman may have to truncate below her first choice, meaning that each woman submits a preference list with one man. And these would all be distinct men. So in a sense, if you look at the submitted preference lists and you see 
okay, so each woman submitted just one man and they're all this thing. This, this looks really, really fishy. Far more fishy in a sense than uh, men submitting preference lists that are full, but at the top of each one is, is a unique woman. It's somehow less obvious. Both are statistically improbable, but somehow this is much more obvious than the other one. And indeed, Gospel and Irving in 89 have said that no res have already noted then in their book that no results are known regarding achieving this by any means other than truncation, uh, like permuting preference lists, truncating and permuting, permuting and throwing some people into the blacklist. Uh, actually, basically truncating has been studied a lot since in some cases, if you ignore sizes of blacklists, then truncating really gives you a best response to many things. But um, if you start thinking about sizes of blacklists that matter, about how obvious it is, or maybe sometimes you're not allowed to use blacklists, then really Gusfin and Irving felt that something had to be improved here. So um, my main result that I will show today is that indeed you can do something much better than this. Uh, if we say that the number of men and women is n, then the women may force the w optimal stable matching as the m optimal one using a profiler preference list with average blacklist size no more than something very small. Okay, I just so showed you in the previous slide that it's known how to do this with an, with an average blacklist size of no more than n minus one, right? If every woman has n minus one, then the average size is also n minus one. So um, I made a short poll. I won't give it to you here because some people hear this talk for the second time. Some of you read the abstract. Some of you don't know uh, a lot about this. But I did give this poll at a seminar in Doug Stuhl in November on electronic auctions and markets. And I'll show you uh, what happened there. I basically asked the question, what do you think? Do you think maybe it's n minus some constant, which is basically what you get using truncation? Maybe it's, maybe it's n over a constant, maybe half of n, maybe O of n over log n. Many things in matching behave like n over log n. Uh, I'm not asking for your op opinion. I'm sorry. I'm asking just a question. Yeah. That depending on your rules, if you're not allowed to use blacklists at all, then yes. So if you're allowed to use the blacklist, even with one person on blacklist, you can force this you can force the system not to have a solution. And so are you taking You can force the system not to have a full, full solution. solution. But we do allow matchings in which some people are unmatched. That's okay. perfectly legal. Okay. Uh, another option is like square root of n or maybe log n. A lot of things in matching are like log n or maybe a constant. So I asked this question in the uh, Doug Schultz seminar on electronic markets and auctions. You can try to uh, see if you recognize some people from the audience in here. And the vast majority, um, actually this answer got more votes, twice more votes than twice that of any other answer. Uh, consensus was a log n. And actually, I'm going to show you that this is constant, actually a very small constant, less than one. So, um, summary of main result, the women may force any M rational full matching as the unique stable matching using a profile of preference list at, in which at most half of the women have blacklists and in which the average blacklist size is less than one. Compare this to each woman having a blacklist of size of size n minus one, meaning average size of n minus one. And this is tight. I hope I will show what it means tight, but basically I show here that the sum of all blacklists is at most n minus one. So that means that the average blacklist size is less, is less than one, okay? And the fact that the sum of all blacklists is n minus one is tight. Some, sometimes you actually need this, you can't avoid it. And uh, I also give an algorithm to compute this uh, uh, set of preferences efficiently. Okay, it's not just an existence proof. And generally, many such profiles of preference lists exist. Okay, I mean, I do permute some things, but there are quite a lot of places that I don't touch. So it's not like a singular 
th this actually, th this is a set of possible preference profiles. And this allows for far more inconspicuous manipulation, especially if in advance participants are asked to submit preference lists that are not full. For example, in, in, New, York, in New York, when students are matched to high schools, each student is asked to submit a, a list of, I don't remember, five or 13 schools. And in this case, it's very easy to, to manipulate since the blacklists are built into the system. And if women pay a price for every man that they blacklist, whether this is a real monetary price or maybe a price of higher probability for the, uh, for the conspiracy to be spotted or something like that, then this is really an order of magnitude improvement over, uh, over trunc truncating. Uh, regarding unbalanced markets, sometimes there are more men than women or more women than men, then we observe a phase change. When there are less women than men, even like 1,000 women, 1,001 men, then no blacklists are required whatsoever. Things can be done using permutations, that's it. And when there are more women than men, even like 1,001 women, 1,000 men, then we pay a very high penalty for each to be unmatched woman. She may have to blacklist as many as all men. So this is really, the balance case is really a phase change in between these two. Um, many, some people here uh, may know that Ashlagi and uh, Kanoria and Leshno in 2013, last year, have shown a similar phase change with regards to um, the expected ranking as, of stable partners. They have shown that if there are more men than women, then in a random market with very high probability, uh, men get very highly ranked women, while women get uh, very lousily ranked men. And if there are more men, uh, no, w more women than men, it's the other way around. And when it's exactly equal, is, it depends on whether you take the M optimal or the W optimal stable matching. Um, you can think about the shoe market, the smaller, uh, s smaller side of the market determining the prices and so on. I mean, this is a repetitive uh, theme in, in quite a few markets. While these have similar qualitative consequences, they, these are completely different proofs. It's not like one of them uh, uh, yields the other. But basically, both of these, Schlage et al's result and this result, say that the preferences of the smaller side of the market, even if only it is slightly smaller, play a far more significant role than may be expected in determining the stable matchings than those of the larger side. And in a sense, uh, while Schlage et al. show this for a random market, we in a sense show this for any market. So different results, but strengthening the qualitative uh, statement. More generally, we basically answer the question of um, how much, if at all, do given preferences for one side of the market uh, a priori impose limitations on the set of stable matchings at all. I'll give you one insight. Um, basically, it looks like, okay, but when are you going to see a situation with in an entire side collide? So nice theoretical result, but what do you want from us? So he here's a real, a real uh, implication. Uh, talk about goods allocation problems. In these kinds of problems, there are two sides, the buyers who have preferences and the goods who have no preferences because they're goods. Think maybe about... Uh, 30 buyers and 30 houses, say that all houses cost the same, and each person has a, preference as, has a preference list over houses, but houses have no preferences since they're houses. So Abdul Kadiroglu and Sonmez, who said that correctly, and Abdul Kadiroglu uh, et al, uh, consider a version of the student optimal Gale Shapley algorithm for assigning school seats to children. Okay, so in uh, New York, um, most schools are not allowed to have preference list, preferences over the students. Some very specialized uh, drama schools, art schools, and so on may have preference lists. But, and some other schools allow, are allowed to give priority to students living close by, but that's about it. So most students there do not have uh, most schools there do not have preferences, and even those who have preferences have very coarse preferences. So um, both these papers 
talk about, uh, okay, so let's randomize tie-breaking rule, rule for the schools, meaning that if a school has no preferences, let's randomize preferences for it, and if a school has course preferences, let's randomize between uh, students who have the same, uh, the, the same priority, and then let's run the student optimal gale shapley algorithm. Let's uh, find the student optimal solution. Okay, let's think about students as the men. And uh, let's hope that, you know, it's student optimal, so something good for the students come out of it. So both papers say that in this case, they say that um, un informally, a single lottery for all schools, what does that mean? It means that instead of for each school that has no preferences, let's randomize preferences for that school, we'll do one lottery and set the same preferences for all schools without preferences, which seems really unfair because if a student got a lousy score in that lottery, then they're doomed in all schools. But um, both papers say that advocate a single lottery for all schools over uh, a different lottery for, for each school, saying that it results in higher social welfare. So the result that I just showed you um, can actually be used to formally justify this in a worst case meaning. Because um, if, think about houses who have no preferences. Basically, this result shows that if we uh, do a different lottery for each school, meaning that we set a different preference list for each school, then basically all buyer rational matchings are possible. Think about the schools, the women. We have just so shown that the women can force practically everything. If you even give them like an average, uh, allow them an average of one size blacklist per uh, of uh, blacklists of size one, which is almost always the case because you never randomize preferences over every, everyone. And a single lottery results in what's called random serial dictatorship of the buyers, meaning that whoever won first in that lottery gets to pick first. Whoever won second in that lottery gets to pick out of everyone who wasn't taken yet. Whoever won third in that lottery gets to pick anyone that the first and second haven't picked, and so on. And we know that the result of random serial dictatorship is Pareto efficient. So if we're talking about what's the worst case that can uh, happen here, what's the worst thing that can happen here, then here the worst case can be any birational matching. Here the worst case is a birational matching that is Pareto efficient. So at least in the worst sense, uh, in the worst case sense, uh, this is a formal justification of this uh, uh, informal statement. Um, when did we start? Who's the? Uh, eight minutes. Okay, eight minutes is. Um, okay, so I'll skip the formal statement. I'll just show you a little bit. I'll try and show you the tightness result. I'll show you that indeed uh, I can s have preference lists for the men that in order to, um, and a matching, f and the matching, that if the women wish to uh, force it, they will need to have a total blacklist size of n minus one, no matter what they do. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't it also yeah. have tightness with respect to the small staff of women? Yeah, actually for every, I didn't show this, but uh, basically, if you, you can give me sizes of blacklists uh, between only one blacklist or no blacklist and half of the blacklist, you can set the exact sizes as long as they meet something that I haven't said. And for th that's basically, I guarantee to you that my output will look like this, it's like blacklists that, uh, whose sizes uh, uh, meet a certain condition. And for every a uh, set of sizes that meet this condition, I can give you an example uh, where this is the best thing you can do. So, yeah, for if you, okay, is, th does that answer your, uh, I mean, it's gonna have, it, it needs five more minutes that I don't have, but it's basically, yes, there's tightness with regard to everything I've mentioned there. Okay, so um, let me uh, take two minutes out of the seven that I have to uh, quickly show you a way to find the M-optimal stable matching. Um, it's a bit different than Gale and Shapley's algorithm, but uh, it's based on Dubin's and Friedman, but this is what we'll use in the uh, tightness proof. 
Okay, set up. Every man serenades under the window of the woman he prefers most. Okay, assume that each woman stands in a window. Uh, no two women are in uh, vertically uh, aligned windows or something like that. Um, we say that a man is scheduled for rejection if he is blacklisted by the woman to whom he serenades or if she prefers another man currently serenading under her window. On each night, each step of the algorithm is called night, choose an arbitrary man scheduled for rejection. He moves to serenade under the, women, the window of the woman next on his preference list, or if he has exhausted all the women, then he sits lonely on the bench. And when no, we, at each night, we see if there are any more uh, uh, men scheduled for rejection. If so, we choose one of them. He gets rejected, so on, so on. When no men are scheduled for rejection, the algorithm terminates. Each woman is matched with a man serenading under her window. There is only one such man. If there were more than one man, one of them would be scheduled for rejection. Everyone else is unmatched. So let's use this in order to show that uh, in a special case that can be easily generalized for all n, um, a total blacklist size of n minus 1 is needed. Actually, I will show you that I can always make uh, one of the women have to reject n minus 1 men, which means that the total blacklist size must be n minus 1 or more. So um, these are the preferences of the men. m1 likes w2 over w3 over w4 over w1. M2 likes W3 over 4 over 1 over 2 and so on. It's like this cyclic thing. And the women wish to force this matching. M1 with W1, M2 with W2, M3 with W3, and so on. And first I will show you that these preference lists, one, uh, total blacklist size of N minus 1, right? N is 4, this is 3, um, actually force this matching. So let's do this quickly. Um, first night, every man... Uh, approaches the woman he likes most, then uh, you'll have to trust me on that. There's kind of this rejection pattern. M4 is rejected, rejected, rejected until here when M3 is rejected. And then similar with M3 who reject com gets continuously rejected till here where M2 starts to be rejected in, uh, in its place. And finally uh, M2 gets here and then M1 gets rejected all the way here. The thing to note about this is that the order of preferences of the men is cyclic in the same direction, meaning that whoever gets rejected from W1 always goes to W2, whoever gets rejected from W2 always goes to W3, etc. Um, note that, by the way, we did get the matching that we wanted, but the main thing that I'm going to show you in two minutes now is why we always need a blacklist of size 3 for one of the women. So I'm going to claim that in some sense, the run of the algorithm will always look like this. I don't know what the values in these stars are, but it will look something like this. Okay, we start with a rejection by some man from a woman, by some woman. I don't, some man must be blacklisted, otherwise uh, this will be the final matching, which is not what we wanted. And um, so let's say that W1 rejected M4 without lots of generality. Then M4 goes on to serenade to W2. I don't know who W2 will reject, but whoever that is will go to W3. I don't know who W3 rejects, but whoever that is will go to W4. I don't know who she rejects, but whoever that is will go to W1. So one round complete. Are we done yet? No, because in order to be done, we need to have 12 rejections, right? Because M1 needs to be rejected by w, w, W2, W3, and W4. M2 needs to be rejected by W3, W4, W1, and so on. Count it, not enough rejections yet. We're not done yet. Second step, I, okay, so someone has to reject someone. And it will look like this. Maybe not exactly like this, maybe like this. Maybe it will start here. But it will be the same cyclic uh, pattern. And once again, no, not enough rejections, another cyclic pattern, and we're done. So, OK, you can tell me, OK, so spoke so far. But look, this guy got rejected because of a blacklist. This guy got rejected because of a blacklist. And this guy got rejected because of a blacklist. You promised a blacklist of size 3, right? 
But let's look at this guy. This guy has been rejected here, so he was scheduled for rejection. But clear, if he's scheduled for rejection, he's either blacklisted or the other person singing here is preferred over him. But the other person singing here has been blacklisted here. So this person must have been blacklisted as well, giving us a blacklist of sites three for W1. Um, same goes for this guy, by the way. So black, total blacklist size of five. But in any case, the person who initiate the woman who initiated the last round has a blacklist of size three at least. Um, okay, so I think I'll finish here. If anyone has any question. Sorry? Uh, this is from some book I found on online. I verified that it's out of copyright, so I'm fine in that sense. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.